Howdy. Welcome back to Dion Talk. In my strategy to reach financial freedom, it took about 10 years. I was a single parent with three kids. And when I talk about house hacking, I hear a lot of people say, there's no way I could do that because I have a family or I have young kids. And I want to stress that there are multiple ways to use the strategy of house hacking to reach financial freedom. So today I have a friend named Jeremy who's going to come on and share his story of how with eight kids, he is house hacking his way to financial freedom with a strategy that almost anybody can reproduce. So Jeremy, if you could take just a few minutes, tell us about the size of your portfolio now, a little bit about what that cash flow looks like, and then we'll go through the story of what got you started in real estate. Um, so my name is Jeremy Kirkwood. I am a, a real estate investor, amongst other things, uh, here in the greater Fort Wayne area of Indiana. Currently, I have six properties. Um, through real estate, I'm making approximately $5,000 a month, I would say. Uh, so that's kind of my, my cash flow at the moment, but I've got lots more in the pipeline. And when did you start investing in real estate? Well, I attempted to start investing in real estate many years ago. Uh, unfortunately, when I was in the Navy, every place that we went, it seemed as though the um, cost of living was extremely high. Prices of homes were extremely high uh, compared to what we were making on our, our military salary. I had a lot of experience at failing, but I started about uh, three and a half years ago with my first home. Okay. So super impressive. Six properties in three and a half years. Um I've been investing about 10 years and we have about the same size portfolio. Um, so really good job on that. And I, I, I do see that a lot with people in the Navy. Navy ports are along coastlines where the property is super expensive, which means that some people should think and join the Marine Corps because they put, the, put you in the middle of nowhere in 29 Palms, where a lot of investors um, are investing in Joshua Tree, which is very close to 29 Palms. Great place, great returns. Uh, not so much in San Diego, not so much in Everett, Washington, not so much where the property values are so high for the Navy. So that is a challenge. And so you have six properties now. Are they located in Indiana? Yes. All of them are actually located in, um, in Greater Fort Wayne. Uh, this market is uh, it's the 12th market, 12th growing market right now. Um, it's very stable. Uh, population has been very stable. Uh, there's lots of high quality jobs in manufacturing here. Uh, I purchase um, most of my personal properties that I house hack in an A plus neighborhood. Um, but then I also have moved into an area in our city that's up and coming. Uh, we have several development projects going on that have really um, billion, billions and billions of dollars of development projects um, that are forcing renovations in some of the uh, duplexes and single family homes. Some of those prices are still incredibly low, around 50,000 to 100,000, depending on if you're talking single family or, or multi. So in the Navy, you moved around a bit, kind of the normal military thing. How'd you end up in Indiana? Before job interviewing up here, I had never even been to Indiana before, um, but I, I really enjoyed it. I, I thought it was a pretty cool place to be, very family friendly. Uh, we have a large family. Uh, we have eight kids. That's actually not that uncommon up here. And there's Amish people. And it's, um, it's a good place to raise a family. So what I ended up doing was, after job interviewing a ton, um, I googled most affordable housing in the United States, because I felt like homeownership was probably one of the most important things for my family. And uh, where we were living in South Carolina, my wages were not keeping up and uh, struggling to attempt to purchase a home. And um, sure enough, it worked. Uh, and we've loved Indiana ever since. One of the challenges with house hacking is people put it in a box and they think house hacking means renting out rooms in your house and sharing living space with other people. Or the strategy that I use where I buy small multifamily like a duplex or I'm in a fourplex now where I live in one unit and rent out the others. I'm super cheap. I actually still rent out rooms in my unit because my kids are older and moved out of the house. With eight kids, can you walk us through how you are house hacking? We accidentally became house hackers. Um, I'm a little bit of a, a perfectionist. And so uh, we purchased a, uh, I would say a B plus, maybe a B home in an A plus neighborhood. And um, we got a great deal on it. Um, I used a VA loan. And because I have a 10% uh, service connected disability. Uh, I didn't have to pay the funding fee for that. And so we purchased this home with a, with a VA loan. 
and then I went about making it perfect. Um, and it has since become my business model for this area where you're looking at a home that was built in 1990 or 1992 and all of the fixtures are brass and all of the um, uh, wall plates and that type of thing are, are yellow, kind of like the one behind me, or uh, there's no lights inside of the dining room, those type of things. And then we completely fit, flip it, make it a showcase home. And um, during COVID, it became apparent with me and my eight kids that we were trampling all over each other and Zoom calls weren't working very well. <laughs> Uh, so I decided to purchase a home that was 50% larger. I again used the VA loan, which a lot of people don't know that you can do. After a certain period of time, and I believe it's still a year, um, if you purchase a, a more expensive home or a larger home, you can use that VA loan again. So I did that again. We purchased this home uh, by kind of coercing the uh, agent and the uh, seller that we were the best buyers for them uh, simply because they were not willing to accept VA, FHA, USDA, anything other than conventional because we are, are in a very hot market here, uh, but we were able to do that as well. So two quick things before some people turn off their brains, because what I found in real estate is if you really want something, you find a way. And if you don't want something, you find an excuse. And there's probably a listener out there who heard you say, I use my VA loan and they checked out. The VA loan can be zero down and it doesn't have PMI, but that doesn't mean you can't use first time homebuyer programs that have grants like the one that um, is coming out now with $15,000 first time homebuyer, $25,000 if you are, what is it, economically disenfranchised. So you could put 3.5% down on a fourplex. And you used your VA loan, which you can reuse again, as long as you're going for a bigger single family house. There's a strategy that Matt, the lumberjack landlord talks about that works for VA and FHA called four, three, two, one. If you buy a fourplex with an owner occupied FHA or VA loan, you can then move to a triplex, to a duplex, to a single family, because as long as you're moving to a single family or a larger single family, uh, those loans are reusable. If you're using FHA, it's reusable and it's always 3.5% down. Here's a challenge I wanna know how you got around. In a hot market, you said it, sellers are usually looking for conventional loans. Um, there is a perception that an FHA loan and a VA loan are harder to get approved because there's more appraisal problems that can come up, which I've never seen. How did you get around that with the seller? Yeah, so you, you hit on a couple things there. Um, there is a perception that uh, VA um, loans, they will, the appraiser will come out and they'll look at it and they'll appraise it for, um, for less than a conventional loan would, a, a appraiser would go for it. And I think that there may be a small amount of merit to that, uh, because I, I actually had two that, um, uh, appraised under, and I will tell you this, this is probably the biggest gem that, that you can get out of this. When when you submit your offer and the offer is accepted by the buyer, go ahead and do, do your work and send comps with the offer. Send it to the seller's agent, send it to everybody, and then uh, find some high quality comps and know the area that you're buying in. And um, you know, do half of the work for the appraiser and they're going to be happy with you. Uh, they'll look at it and it, they just half their time is, is done. So, you know, try to choose three to five. Um, some places are more difficult to comp than others. I would, I would definitely say that. Um, but my last two have come in at the exact dollar amount that I'm paying. Um, so I have a feeling that, that that helped out quite a bit. So that's, that's one strategy. And the other strategy is this. Um, find out what the seller needs. So for instance, this seller, they needed a, um, a, a bit of time in order to go find a house. So we made it not contingent on the sale of our home. And then we rented our home that we were previously in. They had 60 days or so to go find a house after we closed. They found a house. There was trouble. So what we ended up doing was having them rent back from us for a short period of time. So we actually recouped rental income um, for a short amount of time from 
the sellers of, of this home. Uh, so it worked out really well. Adding that flexibility and thinking creatively in order to get the deal um, was extremely important. And I, I'll give you just a, a comparable to, to why it was so important. The home that we're in, uh, it's about 3,600 square feet. And there is a same, the same home one street over. And uh, the week before, it sold for $25,000 over asking. So the sellers of this home looked at it and they said, well, our home needs a little bit of work. Maybe we can get you know, what they were asking. And so we got it exactly at, at what they asked. Um, we got it a little bit less, I think, in the end than their other home, the other home. So I ended up not spending an extra 25 grand um, to get this house because of flexibility. Figuring out what the other side of a negotiation wants or needs is key. And, and sometimes that's where seller financing can come in. Maybe the seller doesn't want to pay a large capital gains tax and they're not going to use a 1031 or they're looking for a consistent income, but they're at the age where they don't want to manage tenants or, or a property. And if you can figure those things out, it helps you know what to offer. And here's just a little bit of advice for somebody who's thinking, if I want to buy a place and they need time to buy a property, um, you kind of take a risk, especially while, while there's an eviction moratorium going on and it's harder to get people out of your house. It's possible in your contract to do a, a holdback where you purchase the price of the property, but $20,000 sits in title. And if the seller moves out within three months or six months or whatever you agree to, then that $20,000 goes to the seller. If they don't, because they refuse to move, then the $20,000 goes back to you. Or you can both agree, all right, you can have another three months to find a place that 20,000 still sits in, in title in escrow until you actually move out to kind of make sure the seller is going to you know, do what they've committed to do. And, and that works in a lot of cases where sellers want to sell their house, but the, the problem is they don't have a house to move into yet. Okay, so you're, you're reusing this strategy of house hacking where instead of shared living space or buying a small multifamily living in one unit and renting out the other, you are using owner financing to purchase a property with low money down, fixed rate, 30-year fixed rate debt at a good interest rate because your owner owner occupying for a year. Some lenders, it can be a little more aside for some say 10 months. Um, and then you're rinsing and repeating that. And this is possible with VA, FHA, even with conventional. If you're buying houses, the down payment for a conventional to owner occupy is 3% if you haven't owned a house for the last three years. So that first one has a 3% down payment. After that, it's only 5% down. So even if you already have a house that you're moving out of to turn into a rental, that next conventional loan, if you're going to owner occupy, can be 5% down. And as you start the income snowball and you have a couple of these properties that are cash flowing, it gets a lot easier and a lot faster. Um, so before we wrap this up, we are going to do a deal deep delve into your last purchase. Um, so it's, it's impressive that you, you have six properties now. Your last purchase we talked before was in May. And how many properties do you have under contract now? Currently six properties and um, I have four that are going to go through this month and uh, maybe an extra one thrown on top there. It's a five plex that I'm, I'm really trying to pull down. <laughs> okay. um, it's just a great opportunity in a great area, um, great building with great tenants. So i I'm going to throw that to a property manager probably. Um, but yeah, uh, at, at least another four, some very interesting ones in there. Um, so yeah, yeah, got a lot going on. Okay. And I look forward to hearing about those once they close too. Especially Absolutely. the reason I do my deal deep delves is during 2020, 2021 with the pandemic and the moratorium and all of the problems that are going on, many investors have held back, especially the ones that watch YouTube channels that talk about the impending crash or how Zillow selling 7,000 houses is going to somehow impact the market where it takes 3 million properties on the market to make a balanced market. Right now we have between 1.1 and 1.3. So we're, we're not, not even halfway towards a balanced market. 7,000 properties, if Zillow gave them away, wouldn't impact the market. Anyway, off the soapbox about that. I actually have seen that in my market as well. So, you know, we have a very, very, very competitive market. And one of the reasons why creative financing is, is so important, uh, especially things like seller financing for us, is that we need to find people with problems in order to get houses. Because 
the right now we're, I mean, we're a larger metropolitan area uh, and there's 344 homes on the market. And some of those are not good homes. I can tell you that right now. Um, you know, I look at the MLS and there is just not much there to be honest, they go in a day. So you, you kind of have to get creative uh, and, and meet people's needs in order to, to buy right now. Okay. So, and right now you have the six properties, about 5,000 a month in cash flow from that. Do you have a, are you still working a W2 job? No, I actually quit uh, September 23rd of this year um, for a few different reasons. I came off of a paternity leave uh, for my eighth kiddo and I just didn't want to go back. And uh, it was not, not, not helpful for me, at, at, you know, to, to go back in. And I really, started focusing so much on real estate and, and on uh, some passive income strategies that uh, it wasn't necessary. And uh, I needed to push myself a little bit with some, um, with some energy to, to get me rolling and, and scaling larger. So about three and a half years to reach financial independence, maybe not financial freedom where you can just go out and spend money without thinking about it, but financial independence where you're in charge of whether you need to go to work or not. Um, it's very impressive. One more question. So since you're no longer working in W2, seller financing becomes very important because things like your credit score and your debt to income ratio and kind of things like that, the appraisal aren't a factor as much. How are you going to secure funding going forward? Yeah, that's been that's been really tricky. Um, I've had to learn quite quite a bit uh, about the non qualified mortgage market, which is somewhere between conventional financing for a home and uh, hard money. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll plug him, uh, Steve Dow at Velocity Mortgage. He's a a great guy. He's been helping me out quite a bit. Um, to look at financing in that direction. The problem with doing that is, is that you're bringing in 25%. So that's one of the reasons I moved out of an A plus market to a B minus C plus market was that, uh, you know, you can only do 25% so many times and you just run out of, out of cash flow uh, or run out of cash stockpile, I should say. There's a couple of different strategies you can use on that. Uh, one of which is to have the seller carry 25% through a vehicle like a, a land trust or a, um, uh, a, there's quite a few different vehicles that, that you can use for that, that take power from one side to the other and have different legal, legal ramifications. Um, the other thing that I've been doing is uh, doing 100% seller financing. And that works really well if you have a landlord who has had a place rented or has a place rented and they want to continue an income stream. They don't want to get taxed for, for selling it because they're not owner occupying it, you know, ever. Um, and they, they want to continue that income stream. So what I can do is I can get uh, an investment property from an investor and I can pay at retail, if not even a little bit higher, and just pay them in installments depending on the deal and the structure, what they want, how they how they need it. What I really like is you're finding a way to get what you want. And again, I think there's probably somebody watching who may heard you may have heard you say non-QM mortgage, which people know the rates and the fees are usually a bit higher with that. The interest rate and the fees is almost irrelevant unless you compare it to what rents you're getting. And with rents going up as much as they are right now, if you can find the deal that gets you the yield that you're looking for, I don't care how much money, how much interest I pay towards a bank or towards the seller, as long as my yield is what I'm, I'm wanting to get out of the deal. So that's a great way to solve that problem where you don't have the W-2 income to get the conventional loans. I completely agree. And you know, I think if anybody wanted to make me a, a t-shirt, it should say, but does it cash flow question mark? Because that's, that's really, you know, I, I'm not as concerned about appreciating value. I mean, it helps in an A plus neighborhood, I'll be honest, but, um, uh, and we can go more into that in the deal, deal deep dive. Um, but, uh, you know, if it, if it cash flows and it meets your requirement, let's say you want 11% a year and it makes 12, 
do it. Uh, you know, do your math, make sure you have capital expenditures and that type of thing. But a good example of this is one property that I'm doing with a, with seller financing. Uh, I walk up to the property and there's two front doors and then there's two back doors and we go into the basement and there's two water heaters, one of which is disconnected. And I look at the property and I say, uh, this was a duplex. And sure enough, I look it up. It's a duplex. I can turn it back into a duplex, um, probably for around $10,000 and some sweat. And um, that's what I'm going to do. So instead of it being a property that that's sitting on Zillow for 200 days, now it's going to become a, a perfect little duplex for me in an up and coming area. And I could pay whatever I wanted uh, for that within reason. That's beautiful. I, I understand your house hacking while you live in the house is to repeat the annual purchase of a house and you have your eight kids and living in an A neighborhood and taking your, you find a B house in an A neighborhood and then you upgrade it. it makes total sense. I like to buy in C class neighborhoods. Um, for me, it was easier to find the cash flow that I was looking for. And if there's ever an economic downturn, you know, like a pandemic or prolonged government shutdown or stock market crash, People in A and B areas may move to a C area to save money. Hardly anybody's going to move to a D area or a war zone to save money. But in bad times, I think those properties that you're buying now in those C class areas, those would be the ones I would prefer because you will have more tenants when there are problems. I completely agree. And the other thing that I, I, you know, I really think about, and I think people don't really understand how much housing is needed. Um, particularly by renters. The last home that I rented out, we had, I mean, I, I spent uh, two days going through applications and credit reports. And some of these folks made $400,000 a year. And we had um, a couple people who were ask, asking to pay over rent to be considered because they had something negative in their past. Um, I, have, I get text messages from people that I showed my last house to that say, hey, I still need a house. Hey, I still need a house. And, um, you know, we're talking about properties where the rent is 23 or 25 or $2,700 a month. But people will do it because they need a house. They have a large family. And for some reason, they don't want to or can't purchase a home. Uh, and it's the exact same way in those C areas. Um, you know, this, like I mentioned before, they're building these giant industrial complexes with that are going to produce thousands of jobs and someone could go work there, pay me a thousand dollars a month in, in rent and be totally happy with their lives. They could walk to work. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that is, that's correct. Yeah. That's a, it's a hedge against, um, you know, the, some sort of downturn. Yeah. I mean, well, and property is a great, Rentals are a great hedge against inflation. Uh, and this almost sounds insensitive when you say it, but inflation sucks. Gas costs more, fuel costs more, rents go up, everything sucks, right? If you have appreciating assets up to a point, inflation is your friend, which is one of the reasons why I try to make this content to get more people on the property ladder so they can get a few properties so that they can benefit from appreciation, which when we invest, at least, it sounds like you're the same as me. We don't count on appreciation. We don't even really know that it's going to be there. We're looking for the cash flow. You're sure. But does it cash flow? Um, as an investor now with some properties and closing on some more, what is your opinion of inflation? Inflation is terrible. You know, having eight kids and watching the price of General Mills foods go through the roof is daunting. You know, it's it, it's rough. And I, I really feel for people. Um, I will say, though, that... Yeah, next year, uh, once one of my properties is vacating in August, it rents for 23, I'll probably ask for 25 or 27, um, simply just because I know I can get it. I know people can pay for it. Wages are also going up um, as well. Um, and then, you know, the, the other thing about inflation, too, is that it raises the price of everything. But the price of some things, once supply constraints go down, um, for instance, you know, the wild swings in lumber prices and things like that. Once those prices come down a little bit, um, you know, you'll see people doing more with lumber and that type of thing. But with housing, it sticks. I mean, people don't just, you know, there's not a reduction in the price of a home because it requires labor, 
expertise, skills, trades. It is one of those things that there's always going to be um, a, a replacement cost or an opportunity cost between building a home and, and an older home. For instance, the home that I'm in right now, um, my insurance, they have it at $780,000 replacement cost, which is absolutely crazy. And I know people who are saying $300 per foot to build a new home. So real estate, the prices tend to stick and stay there. Um, but the prices of everything else can fluctuate a little bit, you know? Uh, and I, I think that's a very important thing to know is that there's a lot of stability in, in a real asset like real estate. Right. And one of the numbers I like to look at is people can look at a chart and say, home values generally over a long enough period of time go up kind of like the stock market does. But and Matt, the lumberjack landlord had this data probably better than I'm going to say it, but there have been seven crashes worse than the worst real estate crash in 2008. But in 2008, nine and 10, rents went up. It was a bad time. A bunch of people lost their properties to foreclosure. There was you know, ninja loans, adjustable rate mortgages, all the, then the secondary market was selling bad mortgages to banks. So everybody had their issues. But buy and hold investors whose mortgage stayed the same, rents went up. So for a lot of people thinking, I don't wanna buy now because there's a crash coming. Now still the time to buy, even if there's a crash coming, which there isn't. So we're definitely going to get back together and we're going to do a deal deep dive into your most recent purchase, which you closed on in May. But not today. Um, <laughs> if anybody wants to reach out and has questions about how you've done this, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Sure. The best way is Jeremy Kirkwood, um, J-E-R-E-M-Y-K-I-R-K-W-O-O-D on Facebook. I'm wearing a suit. Uh, message me, private message me uh, if, if you want to, uh, especially if you're looking at creative finance as an, uh, as an option. Um, but yeah, if you want to look at creative financing or if you want to talk VA loans, um, I have gone to what they call Tidewater three times, which is where the value doesn't meet up with the appraisal um, and successfully come out of it at least once. So um, if, you, uh, if, you, if you need any advice or help, um, or if you're in service and you're wanting to use your VA loan, which you certainly can do, reach out and be happy to help. Okay. Well, Jeremy, I want to say thanks for coming on here and sharing the story. I'm hoping that we can help somebody, maybe two somebodies. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time.